Hope everybody's having a good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right, guys, as we make our way to our seats, let's pray together. Let's invite God into this service this morning. Let's, let's have a expectations, expectations this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for giving us this place to come gather together to worship you. Lord, we just ask your blessing over this service this morning, Lord, over this gathering. Lord, we just ask uh, that you bring your presence in here today, Lord, that you would flood this place. Lord, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds. Lord, that we would focus on you today. And God, we just ask you to take over in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, worship team, are you guys ready?
myself singing that song all day long sometimes. Manna on the 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee.
So we praise you, Lord God. We thank you, Father. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Great job, praise and worship team. Great time. Well, we're going to continue our worship here, going into our, our, our tithes. And, you know, we, we say every week we have two ways, right? Got the bucket we got online. You know, but whatever it is, th this is just the extension of, of our worship, our, our praise to God, our willingness to recognize how great he is and what he gives to us. And so this is a time to just be able to give back a little bit of that. We're also going to pray over the prayer requests. And, uh, you know, we put them here at the foot of the cross. And um, it just it came to mind as, as we were singing these songs. Uh, uh, Terry and I went to a, a men's breakfast yesterday, Johnson City. And, uh, the speaker that they had there was talking about how, you know, with prayer all the time, we, we have an expectation. It's like, God, I'm praying this. I want this to happen this way. And that's what I'm praying. And that's what we expect. And it isn't always what God wants for us. Sometimes it is. Sometimes exactly what it is that we pray is exactly what we get. But sometimes we pray and it's not what we wanted. It doesn't happen exactly how we thought it was going to happen. And sometimes, depending on what that is, we have this tendency of, well, what happened, God? Why didn't you answer my prayer? When in reality, he did. He answered it in his own perfect way. He answered it in a, in a manner that was best for you because I know I, I'm guilty of it. I'll make some decisions sometimes, and it's really not the best for me. <laughs> I, and I don't realize it until I've already done it. And... You know, then I look at the consequences of it and like, man, that was really stupid of me. I really shouldn't have done that. Well, if I pray about it and God gives me an answer, that's the perfect answer. It's what's right for me. Whether that's what I wanted or not. As a good father, God gives us the best. And God tries to keep us from those bad things. So sometimes those answers to prayer aren't exactly what we think they are. But there's always an answer. And that's what we do every single Sunday, every single time we come before these prayer requests, is we ask for that, that answer. And God has already answered it as soon as we put it out there. So if you would, just go ahead, bow your heads. We'll pray over the offering and the prayer requests. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time to just come before you, Father, and just continue our worship of you. Because, Father, you are great. And, Father, through thick and through thin, Father, you're there for us, and you see to our needs. And so right now, as we go into this time of offering, we just come with a, just a loving heart, Father God. One that's open to you, Father, and one that's wanting to just give back just a little bit in recognition for your greatness and recognition for being the servant that we should be for you. And Father, we just pray that, Lord, your hand would be upon it, and that, Lord God, that you would just, just use it, Father God, for your honor and your glory, Father. And Father, we just pray for these prayer requests that are at the foot of the cross. And Father God, we know that, Lord, you hear each and every one of them, no matter what it is. Father, you listen to us. And, Father, you've taken things into consideration, Father, but you answer every single request that we have, Father God. And so we just pray that you would help us, Lord, to understand those answers sometimes. To understand that it's not always a yes. Sometimes it's a maybe. Sometimes it's a wait. Sometimes it's a no. But, Father God, no matter what that answer is, Father God, it is perfect for us. And it's in your perfect will. So help us, Lord, to be able to accept that, Father, to understand that, Father God. We just thank you. We praise you, Father. Just go with us throughout the rest of this service, Father, and help us to keep an open heart to you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.
Special? Okay. All right, I guess we have a special then. <laughs> And I'm going to talk for just a second because Cherish is on our way back from the grocery store. We have a leaders meeting after church today, and she went shopping. Um, so she'll be here in a minute. Esther's going to sing a special. So I want her to see it if she can. So I'll just talk for a second. But it is so good to see you all this morning. Man, you look good today. Turn to your neighbor and say, you really do. You look good today. <laughs> I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, <laughs> um, it is a good day to be in church. I was just thinking as we were singing that last song, I, I just love those songs that just talk about how awesome God is, how great is our God. I love that. Maybe one of my favorite songs. It's like whenever I get up and I want to sing something and I can't think of anything, that's the song that always comes to my mind. And I just love that song. And then that tagline of that hymn, you know, I just felt God's presence. And you know, we've talked about this. Maybe I'll refer to this back when I preach in just a minute um, about, you know, not just wanting the, 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 the um, romantic side of God's presence, you know, this feel-good side. I want to be, sometimes I want to feel the awesomeness of God's presence. And I, as I was kneeling this morning, I'm, I said to God, I said, I want you to crush me with your presence. And that may seem really odd to some of you, but I, I'm a guy. I, I want the awesomeness of God. Maybe you ladies feel that way too. Did anybody? Is it just guys? Is it ladies too? I want the awesomeness. I want God to show up like, <laughs> you know, I want God to show up in my life like that. Like everything just falls down. It's like when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden. They said, who he said, who are you looking for? And they said, uh, we're looking for Jesus. Says, I am here. Everybody fell backwards. <laughs> Sometimes I want God to show up in my life like that. Don't you? You know? Come looking for you. Come looking for whatever your problem is. And they say, uh, is Jesus here? Oh, yes, I'm here. Boom. I want God to show up like that. I want God to be awesome in my life. And I felt that. Anybody else feel that during worship today? I felt that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do like the, the gentleness and the softness and that feeling of being loved by God. We need that. But I want, I crave the awesomeness of his presence. I love to praise God when things are really bad in my life and just stick my finger in the devil's face and say, you will not stop me because my God is going to show up in this situation. Ha! Yeah. I love to praise God in those moments. It's not about this sappy thing. And not that you can't be a little sappy. That's okay. That's part of our nature. But I love it when we just, man... God is God, and He's awesome. So, uh, amen? Anybody with me? Am I the only one? Come on, give God some praise. Amen. Amen. So, um, I do want to ask you to pray for Haley. Uh, today is a tough day for her, and uh, just pray for her. Be lifting her up today, if you will. We love that girl. Um, she's wonderful. And uh, just pray God's blessing upon her today. God surrounds her. So, um, I've talked long enough. My wife is here. So, um, appreciate, I, pre I appreciate you, Cherish. <laughs> she does so many things. You know, I always say, if I ever look good, it's because of her. Because of so much she does, the just, you know, she kind of is in the background so much, but if she didn't do what she did, I would just look a mess all the time. So, um, yes, amen. <laughs> amen. And, and, you know, I'm going I'm to get in trouble for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. For the first time in my life this week, I got to kiss a 40-year-old woman. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> on the lips. I've kissed a woman on the cheek, does my mom, but on the lips. The first time I kissed a 40-year-old woman, so amen. All right, so Esther has been practicing this song, and she wants to sing. So would you give Esther a big hand?
I, I was just trying to help her be more energetic. She learned it all on her own. And she's not been reading that long. And there's a lot of words to that song. But she wanted to do it. She kept bugging me. You know, when Esther gets something on her mind, she don't let up. And uh, this, that was all her wanting to do it. Good job. So proud of you. All right. Well, um, I think kids have to be dismissed, so I'll do that. So kids, stand up, if you will. We love our kids. And if any of you other kids want to do that, you know, pick a song that you really like, the worship team does, and you can sing it with them. That might be easier to do than trying to, you know, do it all separately. So uh, you just let Miss Sonia, let Miss Sonia know if you want to. Right, Miss Sonia? Yeah. All right. Well, we just thank you for every one of our kids. They're such a blessing to us. We're so grateful for them. Pray, oh God, you'll just have your way in their class today and just uh, speak to them about who you are. And I pray you'll help their teachers, oh God, give them wisdom, give them patience, give them understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Hello again, everybody. Let's get into the Word today. I'm so excited uh, to continue this series on fearing God. And really, this is part two of one, one and two from last week. There were several things I referenced last week that I wanted to um, actually read the scriptures on. That's a cool duck. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to assume everybody knows everything. So, um, I wanted to, this, this, this is really kind of part two of last week. So if you weren't here last week, um, go back and watch it. It was, uh, it's on YouTube, it's on Facebook. Uh, you can watch it anytime. You don't have to even watch it. You can just listen as you're riding down the road. Um, but um, this really follows on from last week. The title of my sermon today is Confession is Good for the Soul. Confession is Good for the Soul. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We'll begin there. I'm going to tell two stories today. I want to tell the story of David and Nathan and David's sin with Bathsheba. And then I'm going to tell the story of the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And I mentioned their names last week. I got them mixed up between the sons of Aaron and the sons of Eli. That's what was in my head. So I'm actually going to talk about Hophni and Phinehas today. So if you want to, in your Bible, um, we're going to read now in 2 Samuel chapter 12, but we'll go in a minute to 1 Samuel chapter 2. So if you want to put your finger in both or put a little bookmark in the other or however you want to do that. Um, both of them have fairly lengthy passages. I'm going to try to move quickly through each one, but I wanted to give you the full context of both stories and then we'll talk about the difference in them too. So confession is good for the soul is today's sermon. Starting in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. Did I say 12 a minute ago? I'm sorry. Chapter 11, I will be in chapter 12 as well, but starting in chapter 11, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. And that was the first thing he did wrong. He didn't go with the, with the, with the army during the time of war. Verse 2, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David said and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And we'll see as the story goes by, he knew full well who Uriah the Hittite was. And he is, of course, lusting after his wife and now knows fully who he is and who she is. Then so verse 4. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. Oh, that wasn't what he was expecting. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Then 
when da Uriah had come to him, David asked about how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the, uh, the, the war prospered. He acted like it was just a regular thing. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. You can see what he was hoping would happen. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he did not go down to his house. Uriah was messing up David's plan. Obviously, he wanted Uriah to be with his wife, and he could say well, that was Uriah's child, and everything would be hidden. But Uriah was not going along with it. Verse 10. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, um, did you not come from a journey? In other words, aren't you tired? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and the Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go down to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Wow. Uh, here we see that Uriah had a lot more um, uh, integrity, way more integrity than King David. And perhaps be not knowing what David knew, it, uh, Uriah saying that made David mad because he called him out without realizing that he did, right? Verse 12, then David said, let me just say this, sometimes when you stand up for what's right, you don't have to point at anybody else. They'll feel it because you're just being a person with integrity yourself. Amen? All right, verse 12. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also and tomorrow. I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And the evening he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Even alcohol couldn't get him to go against his integrity. Verse 14, in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was when Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. Let's skip then to chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan was known as a prophet. And he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished and grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who would come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who would come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity then Nathan said to David you are the man wow thus says the Lord God of Israel I anointed you king over Israel I delivered you from the hand of Saul I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping gave you the house of Israel and Judah and if that had been too little I would have given you much more why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword you have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me interesting God took offense at this, you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. That actually was fulfilled in, his, in the life of his son, Absalom. 
much later. Verse 12, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the Son. And here's what I really want you to, all that story, maybe you knew this, but this is the part I really want to focus on in the message today. Verse 13, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. You read that verse again. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, your so the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I thank you for this topic of the fear of the Lord, understanding what that is, to awe and respect God. Pray, Lord, you'll continue to help us to see how important that is, how vital that is in our daily lives. And Lord, that we will, uh, Lord, we will respond to you. We will desire for you to call out the things in us that, that, uh, that, that hurt you, that break your heart, that make you angry even at the condition of our lives. And that our response will be not to excuse ourselves, not to push blame on somebody else, but our response will be to repent to a holy God that we might be forgiven, we might be washed and cleansed. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point is humble repentance. Humble repentance. David messed up really bad, and I'm sure that story at least in its uh, essence, was not new to any of you. But just hearing it all play out there is pretty shocking, isn't it? That David King, who was known as the man after God's own heart, would do all of those things. I mean, he followed it all the way through. And actually, I skipped out a verse where he did actually marry the woman he had an affair with, had a child with, that he had killed or ordered the death of her husband. It's pretty bad stuff, right? The thing that is so impressive about this story is not the bad things that David did, but it's his response as soon as it was called out. I even think it's amazing that he allowed, this is king. Now back in those days, king was more than a figurehead, right? They had full, all, complete authority. That he allowed someone in front of his court to say those things as Nathan did to him, to point his finger in his face, Say, you are the man, you are the one, and God is going to judge you for what you did. You know, back in those days, if someone insulted a king, he could have, have their head chopped off, right? And he had the authority to do that. But there were times when, D when David did order the death of someone that appeared before him. When the person came to bring Sa King Saul's crown and everything and said, I killed him, I killed him. And David said, well, we're going to kill you. And he had him taken out right then. He had the authority to do that. But David's response was none of those things. His immediate response was in verse 13. And I've already turned from it. I'll go back. I have sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan's immediate response was, the Lord has also put away your sin. Spoken all over the last, this is, the last couple of sermons about the scripture in Isaiah, where Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a people of unclean lips. And the coal was taken from the altar to purify. What God saw in David's heart and in David's life was not someone that always got it right. He messed up very badly at times, as we just read. But it was his desire when he did wrong, when it was pointed out, to receive correction, to receive accountability, and to desire to be right with the Holy God. So often our response, as we'll see in a minute, is, is very different. So often our response is to be offended, is to be embarrassed. I was humiliated in front of all my people when he called me out in front of all of them, and I'm angry, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm offended, I, I, and, and I want to excuse this. I, I want to blame somebody. I want to blame my childhood. I want to blame the situation. I was under a lot of stress. I was under a lot of pressure. My wife wasn't treating me as she should. There's all these things that I want to blame somebody else for. Instead of saying, recognizing that I stand before a holy God, 
do I fear, awe, and respect God. God, God said that you have despised me because you represent me to the people. You've done this thing. And David's response was, yes, I have. I'm so sorry. Psalm 51, I, wonder, I don't want to read all of it, but I want to read a little bit of this. This is written at this same time or about this same experience. Psalm 51, verse 1, David writes, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you make me to know wisdom. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Can you see, even though David messed up in major ways, why he was called? a man after God's own heart. Because what he recognized when he, in his relationship with God, it wasn't, I talked about last week how much we love the beach and we love the feeling and the smell and the, and the texture of the beach, but then there's a part of the beach that's terrifying when the storm comes, right? There's a part of us that needs to be loved by God and needs to love God genuinely in return. But there's a part of us that needs to respect and all God. And when I fail, and I will, I will fail. I don't excuse it. I don't hide it. I don't cover it up. In fact, if we're going to really live in a way that it respects and awes God, we will allow people in our lives that will point at us when we need it. And we'll receive it. Accountability, genuine accountability, is a part of fearing God. Because you know what? We can, we can fake it, and we do. As church people, as Christians, we fake it all the time to God, don't we? Because we know God loves me. He's going to have mercy on me. And, but you can't fake it to your wife. You can't fake it to your husband. You can't fake it to those that really see you, that work with you 10 hours a day and see your attitude. You can't fake it to those that are around you all the time. They see you and if you allow someone to point at you when it needs to be pointed and you receive that, it keeps you clean before a holy God. So important. Those that, those that run from accountability don't respect God. Don't awe and respect God. Those that are open to accountability, desire it, embrace it, are those that truly fear and respect God. We were talking this week. We've got a uh, we've got a new little dog. Well, he's not little. He's big. He's a puppy. His name's Winston. And whenever I'm not in the room, and Cherish is in the bed, he will jump on the bed. He flops down like he's been there all night. He looks so comfortable. He looks so cute. And I'll walk in the room and I'll say, mm. and he jumps up, gets off the bed. But if I'm not walking in the room, Cherish is like, Winston, you got to get off. <laughs> you can't stay on the bed. Come on. <laughs> she said to me the other day, she says, Winston loves her and fears me. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I don't want him on the bed. I don't want him on the couch. The big dog, he sheds. He can bite stuff. <laughs> Sometimes in our relationship with God, we want one or the other, don't we? 
We want the love of God. But we don't want the fear of God. But truly, what I hope with Winston is that he will grow to love and respect. He'll be a good dog then, right? He'll be a really good dog. And hopefully he'll learn to love and respect Cherish. That'll make him even better dog. But I think part of it is Cherish likes him in the bed with us. That's the problem. But we need both in our life. James 5, verse 16 is a verse I read last week, and I want to come back to it this morning. James 5, verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power as it's working. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another you may be healed. That is something we don't practice most of the time in church. Am I right? We don't want to confess our sins. We don't want somebody to know. We don't want someone to see the dark side of our life. And so we cover it up, we put on a good face, and we come to church and we pretend. We act like everything's right. We know it's not. And it's not like we just want to just continue on in whatever we're struggling with, but we just don't know how to deal with it, and we don't want anybody to know, and so we cover it up. Don't confess our sins. The, the saying that says confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. <laughs> confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. And so being open and transparent is a dangerous thing, right? And most of us are fearful of that. So that's why you got to pick and choose who it is that you're open to and you're real with and honest with. But if you're truly going to live in a way that fears God, you got to be open with somebody. you got to be transparent with somebody. Cherish and I talked the other night, and she was telling me some things she didn't like about me. She was on a roll that night, I'll tell you. <laughs> And at first, I got irritated. I'm like, well, you got a lot of opinions, don't you? But then I thought, I stopped myself for a second. <laughs> Been married 21 almost years now. I realize this is a woman that loves me. She's very good. She's faithful. There's, I'm, I'm doing all the, like, paperwork stuff, and she's running the house, and everything really is in order because of her. And, okay, it, there, maybe there's something I need to hear. And she told me several things. I won't tell you them all because that was just for us. But... There was one thing she told me that she was exactly right. She says, it irritates me when you're talking to someone and you take out your phone and look at your phone. It just really irritates me. I just think you need to put that phone down. Pay attention to the person you're talking to. And at first I'm like, <laughs> But I stopped for a second, counted to five in my head. <laughs> and I said, you know what, you're right. You're right. I thought back a conversation. My, my cousin was in town around that time, and I, I, I was spending some time with him, and it was a busy time at work, and I was taking time to be with him, and my whole time my mind was thinking, I need to be checking, make sure there's not something I'm needed for at work. And that was in my head. And so, and she said it, I went back in my brain to the day before, and I realized, you know what? I did that. I totally did that. You're right. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, don't say anything now in case, in case you haven't. But I've tried to do better at that because she was right. Now I can't say that always do I receive correction and accountability from my wife. Not always been great at that, but I've paid attention to that one. We need this in our life. And that wasn't a sin. It wasn't some deep, dark secret. But it was something that could be offensive to people. And if I want to be the right kind of person in the room with the people I'm talking to, I don't want to be offending them. Amen? You listen. And so we confess our faults to one another. We can be healed. We can stop. We can change. We can be set free from things that we are doing. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. There's a story about Churchill and Roosevelt during the Second World War. And I believe it was at the White House. Churchill was taking a bath. Winston Churchill, this is not, yeah, Winston Churchill. So he's taking a bath. And Roosevelt, who was the president at the time, 
on his wheelchair is going through the White House and goes through the door, not realizing that Winston Churchill's taking a bath. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister. And the story goes, that Winston Churchill stood up, stark naked, and said, the Prime Minister of England has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> And there's a lot of debate about whether that actually happened. I think it did. He was that kind of guy. There's something about being honest and real and transparent that is good for you. And it will bring you into a closer walk with God. So that's David. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and talk about somebody else. And there's a lot of verses here, and I'm going to try to skip through quickly, but I want you to get the context. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. And he would thrust it in the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all the flesh hook would brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. So part of the offering was for the priest, but everything else would go back to that family is how that worked. Verse 15, also before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give me meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer him and say, no, you must take it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord. For the man abhorred the offering of the Lord. The whole context there, they were taking more than they should. Any preachers that you've ever heard of take more than they should? Okay, leave that. That's what they were doing. Verse 22. Now Eli was very old. And he heard everything his sons did to all Israel. And how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle means. They weren't just taking the offering. They were sleeping with the women that came to worship. So he said to them, why do you do such things for I hear of your evil dealings from all the people? No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the people, Lord's people, transgress. So he calls out his sons, but he doesn't, they don't, you'll see, they didn't listen. And he didn't change their role at all. Then goes on, verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And I did not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire. Why do you kick at my sacrifices and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me? To make yourself fat with the best of all the offerings of the people of Israel, my people. Therefore, says the Lord God of Israel, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk me before me forever. But now, says the Lord, now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so there will not be an old man in your house. So they're taking from the people. They're sleeping with the women that come to, the, to, to worship. Eli called them out. They didn't change, obviously. God calls out Eli. And then the next chapter, in chapter 3, you remember the story of Samuel, little Samuel, that God spoke to Samuel and woke him up and he heard God's voice? You know that story? Let me just read it. Maybe you don't. Um, for chapter 3, um, verse 4. The Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He said, I did not call, my son. Lay down again. Verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. And then Eli perceived the Lord had called the boy. Verse 9, the ear Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went down and lay down in his place. And then God speaks to Samuel, little boy Samuel. And what does he say to him? He says, I'm going to judge Eli and his sons. 
because they have allowed this to go on in the house of the Lord. The first time God speaks to little Samuel, it's about judgment for the priest that he is serving. Wow, it's kind of heavy, isn't it? Would nice to be in a light, nice little story about how much God loves them and all those things. But it was, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge Eli. And I'm going to judge his sons. And then it, it goes on, verse 17, Eli asks Samuel, he says, what is the word the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me, all the things he said. He was excited. I want to know. I want to know. What did God say to you? I want to know what it is. Verse 18, then Samuel told him everything. And he hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Chapter 4, verse 11. This is sometime later. A battle was on. They take the ark of the Lord there to the battle. And the ark of the Lord was captured, and two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And later in the chapter, so did Eli. He fell off his stool and broke his neck and died. I wanted to tell you those two stories. Compare the two. David committed adultery, got another man's wife pregnant, caused the, the man to be killed in battle. Pretty bad stuff. The first time it was called out, he repented. Sons of Eli, stealing from the people, sleeping with the pe women that came, who many, how many there were, I don't know. And were they, how was that done? It was that, was they pressuring them? Were they forced out? I don't know what they were doing, but it was happening in the church. They were confronted by Eli. Eli was confronted by a prophet. Eli was confronted by Samuel. Nothing changed. And eventually, the judgment came, and they died. So often when we look at Bible stories, we like to look at ourselves as the hero, don't we? And so we look at these two stories and say, i got a heart like David. I'm like David. That's, that's me. That's me in that story. I'm not sons of Eli. I'm David. Yeah, I've messed up, but as soon as, as, soon as it's called out, I'm repenting. I want to live holy. I want to live clean before God. That's how I am. But the truth is, if we're honest, if I'm honest about myself, we're much more like Hophni and Phinehas than we are like David. Am I right? We tend to excuse. We tend to cover up. We tend to not want to face the situations in our life because we have no real fear of God. We have no real awe and respect for God. When God calls you out, you ought to respond if you respect Him. But if you don't, there is no respect. It's kind of like when I walk into the room and Winston's on the bed, there's an instant response. Because there's a respect for that dog for me in that sense. When God speaks, is our willingness to serve and to please him or not? There's, there's crazy things going on in our world. There's crazy things going on in churches. There are crazy things, and, and things are being being done and, and, and preached and accepted that are crazy. I, I, I watched a, a video uh, of a men's conference. Kevin and I emailed, texted it back and forth where a male stripper, the beginning of the service, is jerking off his shirt and, and, and doing this, uh, whatever he's doing on the stripper pole in the middle of a men's church conference. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. These are the types of things that are happening, and there is no fear of God in so many of our churches and so many of our hearts. And we are more as a nation like Hophni and Phinehas than we are like David. We all know of major leaders. In fact, I, I Googled it this week, and I was going to start to list them all. Then, yeah, I don't want to do that. But we all know of leaders of large congregations, of large ministries who have fallen, right? public in the way they have fallen. And we all know that, and it's devastating when it happens. We all know people locally. There's even pastors in this local area that have been arrested for, for, for abuse of children and all kinds. It's, 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 it, it's terrible. It's terrible what happens sometimes. We all know of those things that didn't happen in a moment. It happened because someone was unwilling to respect and to fear God. No, at some point it was called out. They chose to continue and allow it to happen. 
in this book, and I've got some extra ones in the back, by the way. You can pick one up for $10 today. The awe of God. There's a story in here about a guy called Jim Baker. Anybody know the PTL situation years ago? How he committed adultery and he, all kinds of, all kinds of fraud as far as financial stuff got put in jail. Well, this guy went to meet with him while he was in, while he was in jail. And he says he start, start, talked to him for a while. He says, after 20 minutes or so listening, I felt comfortable enough to ask some questions. I started with the biggest one I could think of. When did you fall out of love with Jesus? I asked this question because earlier in his ministry, his love for Jesus radiated from him. His fire and passion were evident to all who heard him. I wanted to know when his love grew cold and further what caused it. Staring into my eyes with great sincerity, he said, I didn't fall out of love with Jesus. I was shocked and a little angered by his comment. How dare he say this, I thought. I immediately fired back. What are you talking about? You committed adultery seven years before you were prosecuted for the mail fraud that ultimately put you in this penitentiary. How can you tell me that you love Jesus all of those seven years? Without breaking eye contact, he calmly said, John, I love Jesus all the time. My bewilderment was obvious. He paused, and then he addressed it. John, I didn't fear God. He paused again, then more fully elaborated, I love Jesus, but I didn't fear God. I was stunned, speechless, and quite frankly was in awe of what had just been stated. There was silence for a good 15 seconds, my mind processing the entire time. Then he made the statement that still reverberates through my being, John, there are millions of Americans just like me. They love Jesus but they don't fear God. Mm. Talked, mentioned earlier, the service, we want those good feelings and there's nothing wrong with the good feelings of God's presence. But we should desire God to crush us when we need it. Crush me now, O oh God. Speak to me now, O oh God. I don't want to wait till I stand before you before the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, whichever one, I, I don't want to stand before you in that moment and have you crush me. Crush me now. Speak to me now. Call me out now. If there's anything in my life that is displeasing to you, oh God, call me out. Whether you speak directly to my heart or you speak to me through somebody I trust and I can confide in, speak to me now. Because if there's anything that's not right before you, I want it to be right. I want to respond. Teach me, help me to respond like David. Not like Hophni and Phinehas who blew it off and kept going because it, no judgment seemed to come. They lived a long time doing what they did. But I want to tell you, de delayed judgment doesn't mean judgment won't happen. It will happen that I have an opportunity when my heart is spoken to, when conviction hits, to say, God, not out of, not out of fear of God is not that I'm terrified of Him. It's not that I think He's going to hurt me. It's because I respect Him. I honor Him. And if there's anything in my life that upsets Him, God, I want it to be right. Wash me, cleanse me of my iniquity. Take not, David said, your Holy Spirit from me, restore to me the joy of my salvation. God, I want more than anything to be right with you. Confession is good for the soul, but it hurts your reputation. In the end, what are you more worried about? Are you more worried about your reputation? Or are you more worried about a holy God being right with him. Humble repentance. My second point was obstinate pride. And finally, I'm going to wrap this up. We are built for truth. John 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Sometimes that word truth is interpreted as the truth of the doctrine of the word of God, and that's part of it. But it actually can, tra it can translate truly, authentically. We worship Him in spirit 
and authentically. I believe what God wants more than anything for us is to admit He knows us. He already sees us. There is nothing hidden from Him. So why are we pretending? Why do we pretend when we come into His presence? Be honest. Be real with Him. Say, God, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. I don't know how to. I know this is not right. I don't know how to overcome it. But I admit it. Help me, Lord. Point me in the direction I need to to overcome this struggle that I'm having that I might please you. More than anything, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Don't seek to just know His love without His holiness. That's what the fear of God is all about. I don't have a whole lot of time. Let me just say this real quick in Luke 18, 9 through 14. He, it says, also He spoke, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men, <laughs> extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the, this is the end of this. This is a positive end to all of this. This is not about beating you up. This is about understanding when we're real with God, we get forgiveness. When we're real with God, we get mercy. When we're real with God, we get grace. When we are real with God, He lifts us up. Because I'm not hiding anymore. I'm not covering it up anymore. David was not rejected as king. Even though he did some terrible things, he was still honored. Yes, there was some, there was some, uh, there was some repercussions of what he did, but he still remained in his place, Hophni and Phinehas, because they continued to cover it up, were eventually removed, and the entire line of Eli's family was taken out. God wants to forgive you. God wants to cleanse you. God wants to wash you. And that's why He sometimes wants to crush you. So that you'll receive it. That you'll repent before Him. And I'm talking about repenting and getting saved. Maybe someone needs to do that today. I'm talking about Christians. Christians who are covering up things in their own lives. God wants you to repent of those things. Not so that you're destroyed, but so that you're washed and cleansed and forgiven and you are able to be transparent. There is such freedom in being real. There is such freedom. I don't have nothing to hide. Just like Winston Churchill. <laughs> nothing to hide. So free. Tammy used to work in my office years ago. And in the back, she was in the front office and I was in the back office. And there were times when I'd be on the road and she said, someone called, needed something. I said, go look at my desk. It's there somewhere. And, and she said, well, I don't want to get in your stuff. I said, I got nothing to hide. I got nothing to hide. Just don't move stuff because it'll be in a different order and I'll lose it. But if you really have nothing to hide, it's so freeing. It's so wonderful. So much better. First John 1 verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That scripture was not said to people who were not Christians. That was written to church people. If we confess our sins, He didn't want to destroy you. He didn't want to wipe you out. He doesn't want to reject you. As I read the scripture last week, one day when you stand before His throne to say, I never knew you. He doesn't want to say that to you. He wants to be able to know you. We get to know Him in this life. We get to know Him when conviction hits. We get to know Him when we're crushed by Him. And we respond to Him as David did. And when we do, He is faithful. He is just to forgive, to wash, and to cleanse. And you, in the process, get to know, to understand what it means to fear God. And it is awesome. It is wonderful. And not only is it wonderful for you, but it's wonderful for the world around you. Because the world around us is so sick of hypocritical Christians. Am I right? So sick of that. When you quit being that, they will see Jesus in you 
in a way that will be awesome for them. That's what I want. That's what I want. And it's a process. It's every day. And I don't always get it right. And that's why we got to continue to stay humble before God. But even when we mess up, if we're real about that, it shows Christ in us. Amen. Can we stand up together? I got to finish. I got so much more. That's why the series will continue. So much more. But I got to finish today. Worship team, if you'll come. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you, O oh God, for what you're continuing to speak to us through this topic of fearing you. And there is so much more to it. Lord, I, I pray, O oh God, that we've seen and heard today that you're not a God that wants to stay angry with us. You're not a God that, that wants to destroy us. You're a God who came. You came and gave your life on the cross that we might be forgiven and free. You're a God who loves us. But you're a God that also wants us to be real with you, honest with you, on a daily basis. Admit to you, confess to you, and confess to those that we trust the struggles that we're having so that we don't continue in those. We can walk before a holy God without fear. We can awe and respect you and yet also know your love at the same time. I thank you, Jesus. I give you praise, oh God. As we close out the service, they lead us in a worship song. This altar's open. I feel like I preached myself in the altar most Sundays. I'm going to hit the altar. You can join me if you like. I just want so much to be right with God every day. We won't hold you long. We'll just give you a few minutes to respond if you'd like. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols to give us clean hands, give us your Generation.
struggling for a couple weeks before that and uh, you know I've been having some things going on in the family with my niece and Byron was having heart complications again and Brittany of course had some stuff going on as well and I was you know I want to thank y'all for just being a real church where a broken person can come and you know seek out help without my face because I just asked him I was like am I wrong for believing this am I stupid for trying to be faithful in a God that I feel isn't faithful to me back and uh you know, he just, he taught me through it. He pointed me to scripture, Psalm 73, and I still read it every day. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to thank y'all for being a real church. And just, uh, you know, where broken people can come and be healed. You know, I have to be faith. So, I really appreciate that. And I, I love each and every one of y'all. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and close out service real quick. Heavenly Father God, we come to you, Lord, just to thank you for this day. Lord, as we go throughout our week, I just ask that you just uh, help us be real with not only ourselves, but to others around us and towards you. God, let us not hide anything. And God, just help us uh, reach others for you as we go throughout this week, Lord. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. A few quick announcements, as usual. Um, last week we had said that Julian was going to have a, me a meeting this afternoon um, about people who want to help with camp. Instead, just let her know that you're interested in helping with this camp, which is the last week of June, right? So the last week of June, and it's for the little kids, the ones in the back, the youth camp is uh, before that. So if you want to help out with the little kids, it's Wednesday through Saturday, correct? So spending the night. And so even if you are working, uh, she could use some help in the afternoons, doing various things. So if you'd be interested in helping with that, see Julian, just to let her know you're interested, and then we'll have a more in-depth meeting later on about that. Uh, youth camp forms are in the back on the back table. Um, so if you, you have a kid that would like to do that, get those back there. Also, um, next week is Mother's Day. Um, so don't forget Mother's Day. Also, uh, we're gonna kind of transition the way we do some things and we're gonna put the announcements on the screen. And so I'm not gonna be up here every Sunday unless there's something more important to, to speak out about. So before you leave uh, in the future, we're gonna keep these up to date pretty good. And uh, so just look at those. Oh, also graduation Sunday will be May 19th for our graduates. I think there's Talon and Franklin, right? And he's shaking his head no. <laughs> he's going no, he's not. But anyway, so graduation Sunday will be on May 19th to honor our graduates of the church. You guys have a blessed day and we'll see you next week.